Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. I met Agnes in the ninth grade, started dating her, and we were pretty much an established couple from the tenth grade on. We had no problems all the way through high school and, cliche of all cliches, we exchanged our virginities the night of the senior prom. Once we discovered sex, we were at it every chance we got. We had been talking about getting married since the 11th grade, and we had decided that we would wait until we finished college before tying the knot. College changed Aggie. In high school, our peers recognized that we were a couple and the guys left Aggie alone, but those same circumstances didn't hold once we got to college. While there were some old classmates from our high school there, the majority of students were from other places, and the guys didn't see Aggie as my girl. They saw her as a desirable female, and she was constantly being hit on. I knew it was happening, but there wasn't much I could do about it. We had different majors and took different classes, so we usually only saw each other in the evenings after classes and after I got off work. The attention had an effect on Aggie. She became more flirty, for lack of a better word. Several times I saw her walking with other guys, smiling and talking with them, but I was on the other side of the quad and she didn't notice me. Twice I took a shortcut through the student union on my way from one class to another, and I saw Aggie in the cafeteria once with a guy and once with two of them. It never registered on me until much, much later that I never saw her with other girls. It was always with guys. It never worried me. We were a couple, right? We were in love, right? We were planning on getting married, right? So, nothing for me to sweat, right? She was a great-looking girl, so naturally she attracted guys, but she was mine, and she proved it every night when we got together. For years later, we graduated, found jobs in our fields of study, got married and began a life of wedded bliss. I was the poster boy for fat, dumb and happy for almost six years before the balloon popped. It was an accident that brought about my rude awakening. I was sitting at my desk at work when Molly from the mailroom put some files in my basket. I picked up the top one and started going through it. I wondered why it had been routed to me since it concerned an account that Wally Bergman was handling. Wally was an old classmate from high school and college. I was halfway through it when I spotted a major error. A quick calculation in my head told me that the projections were off almost $3 million. I was reaching for my calculator to work out the exact figure when Wally came rushing into my office and asked me if I had seen the file. I've got to make copies of it and be ready to give the Apex people a presentation in half an hour. I have the file right here. I don't know why I have it. I guess that someone wanted me to look it over so I did, but I don't think that you want to present this to Apex. I showed him what I'd found and even though I know it is usually only a figure of speech I'd swear to it that his face went white. Jesus Rob, this could have cost me my job. I need to do a quick rework on it and he took the file and hurried off. It was a Thursday and Aggie always had to work late on Thursdays to get payroll out for the Friday payday so I did my usual and hit Bud's bar after work for his half pound ground round and a couple of beers before heading home. I just finished my burger and was starting on my second beer when Wally came in saw me, and joined me in my booth. He ordered a beer from Sue and told her to give him my bill. It's the least I can do after you saved my job today. I didn't argue with him over it since we weren't talking big money and we sat and talked about work for a bit and then some, have you seen, fill in the blank, and a little of, have you heard what fill in the blank, did. And then Wally turned my world upside down and inside out. I have to ask you this, Rob. It is none of my business and I know it, but you are a nice guy and I really like you. I'd like to know why you put up with Aggie shit. I don't know what you mean, Wally. Why do you let her screw around on you? What the hell are you talking about, Wally? He took one look at my face and is paled and he said, Oh shit. You didn't know. He started to get up, but I grabbed him and pulled him back down. No, you don't, Wally. You don't drop a bomb like that on me and then get up and run. Sit back down and spill it. He sat down and said, I don't know what to say, Rob. Just tell it, Wally. Just spit it out. I thought you knew Rob. I mean it has been what, 10 years, and you don't know? My God, Rob, how could you not know? Know what, Wally? That Aggie is a round-heeled 304. I just stared at him, unable to ask a single question. I'm sorry, Rob. I wish I'd never opened my mouth. I shook off my mental paralysis and said, but you did, Wally, so now you have to finish it. How do you know and how long have you known? I've known since our senior year in high school and I know because I'm one of the many who did her. I was stunned at the information but I had a crying need to know. Start at the beginning, Wally, and don't leave anything out. Please don't leave anything out. The story that unfolded was shocking to me. Not only the content, but the fact that it had been going on for over 10 years and I hadn't had a clue. Not even a wisp of one. 
Two weeks after the senior prom, Wally had gone over to his cousin's house, and as was his habit, he just walked into the house and headed for George's bedroom where he knew George would be on his computer. But George wasn't on the computer. He was on and an Aggie. Wally stood there watching them, and they both saw him, and since neither one of them yelled at him to get out, he undressed and waited his turn. He and George took turns screwing Aggie until she called a halt to the proceedings. She said she had to get cleaned up and meet me when I got off work from my part-time job at Jessup's Market. He and George screwed her off and on whenever I was at work until George met and got serious with Melody Martin. She screwed Wally for a couple of weeks and then one day when he stopped to see her she was already screwing Mike Bella and Justin Walsh and he undressed and joined in. All three of them worked on her until she had to stop so she could meet me. Wally shared her with several other guys and many times she had pulled trains with more than a half dozen guys present. I know that we were friends and all, but it wasn't like we were best friends you know? And you remember how it was when we were 18 and had sex on the brain. You guys were kind of going steady, but I didn't think the two of you were all that serious anyway. I mean if you were really serious would she be screwing anybody who showed her a hard tool? And it didn't change when we started college. As I remember at freshman first semester, she had classes Monday through Thursday and Tuesday through Friday and didn't have any classes on Wednesday. Her last class on Monday through Thursday let out at 2 and her last class on Tuesday through Friday let out at 1. I don't remember your schedule, but when you got out of class you went to work and when Aggie got out of class she was off to a bedroom somewhere. Wednesday was like an all-day sexathon. It was like that all the way through school, Rob. Class schedules changed from term to term but the constant was Aggie spreading after class and until you got off work. I'm making it sound like it was every day, but it wasn't. Two or three times a week though. Most of us guys were shocked when you and Aggie married. We just knew that you had to know what she had been doing, but you married her anyway. A lot of us thought that maybe you were one of those guys who got off on your women doing other men. Tyler thought that maybe you and Aggie were swingers, but no one ever remembered seeing you with another girl, but we were always seeing Aggie with other guys. I had no idea, Wally. Not even the whisper of an idea. Damn, Rob. I'm sorry to be the one to clue you in, but since you never knew it stands to reason that you probably don't know that she has a standing Thursday night day with Bob and Bill Howard. The Tuesday you bowl she sees Mark Willard. I don't know who else she sees and when, but it is a sure bet that any time you are off somewhere doing something so is Aggie. Not that it matters much, but I did stop doing her when you got married. Single woman is one thing but messing around with married woman is something totally different. I don't know what to say, Wally. And I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm sure as hell going to do something. I polished off my beer and stood up to leave. I stopped and turned to Wally. Thanks, Wally. Thanks for the burger, the beer, and for pulling my head out of my bum. As I drove home, I was rolling what Wally had told me around in my head. Did I believe what he told me? On the one hand, I said, no way. Aggie loves me and she wouldn't do that to me. On the other hand was the question, why would Wally lie to me? I had to finally admit to myself that he wouldn't. He knew I'd check out what he'd told me and if he had lied how would we be able to keep working together? The answer was that we wouldn't be able to and Wally knew it. It was going to be hard enough to work with him knowing about him and Aggie, but we would eventually get by it because I did remember what it was like to be a teen and have sex on the brain and I knew that if some other guy's girl had offered me sex back then and I didn't have Aggie I'd have taken it. The real question was, what the hell do you do now, Rob? I didn't know that Aggie and I were through. I could maybe, just maybe, have gotten by a one-night drunken mistake or maybe even a short-term affair if Aggie could convince me that it would never happen again, but outright 304 for 10 years? No way. I was in bed pretending to be asleep when Aggie got home from getting out the payroll and I ignored her when her hand touched me. The witch wanted to give me sloppy seconds and I wasn't going for it. Admittedly, I'd been getting them for years and it hadn't killed me, but I didn't know it at the time. I did now though, and the touch of her hand on my body made my skin crawl and for the first time ever I didn't get an erection when Aggie handled me. I was up before Aggie in the morning, and I had the coffee on and was reading the morning paper when Aggie came down. What happened to you last night? I came home horny and eager, and you were already in bed. That isn't like you, Rob. Something that I ate didn't agree with me and I was feeling poorly, and so I went to bed early. Well, I certainly hope that you are better today. I'm going to need you to do double duty tonight to make up for last night. As soon as I got to work, I called Felix Mather. Felix was a friend from high school and was now an attorney practicing corporate law, whatever that was, and I asked him to recommend a take-no-prisoners divorce lawyer. Shit, he said. What does that mean? It means that what I'd hoped was true isn't. 
That you are looking for a divorce lawyer means that what I thought you and Aggie had is not what you and Aggie have, and that you have finally found out about her. What did you think we had? An open marriage of some type. How else could Aggie do what she was doing and still be with you? I mean, it was obvious to everyone that you were devoted to her, and how could that be unless you were okay with what she was doing? Believe it or not, Felix the first had no clue as to what she was doing until yesterday. Felix was silent for a couple of seconds and then said, Give Tom Sweet a call and tell him I sent you. I called Sweet and told him that Felix recommended him, and he told me that he could see me that day if I could be there at one. I told him I could make it, and I did. Sweet told me that my options ranged from an amicable split to an Attila the Hun scorched earth policy. We were not in no-fault state and adultery was an acceptable grounds for divorce. But to go for a divorce using adultery as grounds you need to have irrefutable evidence. Hearsay won't do it. How do I get the evidence that I need? He took a card out of his desk and handed it to me. It read, Gaston Marshall, private investigator. His office is just across the street. If you want I can give him a call and see if he can get you in right away. Please do. I want to get this over with as soon as possible. Go ahead and start the divorce paperwork and I'll get the evidence to you as soon as I get it. Sweet made the call and 10 minutes later Gaston Marshall was telling me what we needed to do. Unfortunately, one of the things I needed to do was act completely natural around Aggie and not give her any reason to suspect that I wasn't still the clueless clown she was accustomed to. And as distasteful as it may be to you, Marshall said, it means no changes in your routine. If you have sex three or four times a week, you have to do it. If you are usually the instigator, you will need to do it. Just remember that you are no longer making love. You are just getting your rocks off. Do not do anything that might make her change her routine in any way. It is important to us and what we want to happen that she be clueless of the fact that there has been a change in your relationship. I went back to my office and bit the bullet and called Aggie at work. It was our habit to go out for dinner every Friday night and for breakfast every Sunday morning, so when I got her on the phone I asked her if Tricachis was okay for dinner and she said it was. While I was eating my veal Marcella and Aggie was working on her rigatoni and sipping white wine employees of Marshall Investigations were placing wireless cameras and listening devices in the house. As I took a sip of my Merlot, I was running over Marshall's words to me. It is natural that you will try to spot the hidden cameras, but you have to fight the urge. If she notices you doing it, there is a chance that all of our efforts will be wasted. The other thing you will need to do is force yourself to act natural in the bedroom, and that is not going to be an easy thing for you to do unless you are a born exhibitionist. The system is sound and motion activated, and you will be on camera knowing that it is likely that some of my employees will see you. You cannot let that inhibit you. There is a switch that will allow you to turn off the system when you are at home, but experience has shown that most will forget to turn the switch back on when they leave the house. My advice to you is leave the system alone and try and pretend that you are a spicy star at work making a sex tape. After dinner, I asked Aggie if she wanted to go for a few drinks and maybe some dancing, and she told me no. We need to get home so you can make it up to me for letting me down last night. On the way home, she slid over next to me, unzipped my pants. Drive carefully, sweetie. Don't hit anything that might make me bite off your meat. In my mind, what she was doing was not something special for me, but what she had done with a hundred other men over the last ten years. But disgusted as I might be with Aggie, human nature took over a couple of minutes into things, and my body liked it and wanted her to continue on and get me off. Soon I was done, and I turned into our driveway. Aggie then told me to hurry up and get up to the bedroom. I couldn't follow Marshall's advice. No way could I act natural knowing that I might be screwing for an audience. It was going to be a chore just trying to act natural as I screwed Aggie, so I went to where I was told the switch would be, and I shut the system off. I left my cell phone on the seat of the car knowing that when I saw it when I went to leave the house it would remind me to turn the system back on. I don't know if it registered on Aggie or not, but I didn't make love to her that night. I drilled her. Unfortunately, once was not enough, and I had to perform two more times before Aggie would let me go to sleep. I got up in the morning and dressed to go for my morning run, and before I left Aggie reminded me that she wouldn't be there when I got back. I'll be having my hair done, but I should be home by two. I had always wondered why her hair appointment took from nine in the morning until two in the afternoon. Aggie said that it was because she got to gossiping with the other regulars and usually ended up going to lunch with them. It could even be the truth, but after what I'd recently found out I was thinking that she probably met one of her sex buddies either before or after getting her hair done. On my way out, I turned the switch for the system back on. I doubted that anything would happen while I was on my run, but I needed to get into the habit of making sure that the system was on when I wasn't home. The switch only shut off the cameras. 
The listening devices and the phone tap were always on. I did my usual five miles, and when I got back to the house, I went down into the basement and opened up the cabinet above my workbench. It is where I told Marshall to put the recorders. I figured that it was the best location since Aggie rarely went into the basement and almost never went into my work area. There were two receivers in the cabinet. One was for the listening devices and phone tap, and the other was a DVD recorder that received the input from the wireless cameras. I checked the recorder for the phone tap and had my suspicions confirmed. Hello. Good morning, lover. Are we still on for today? You bet. The wife took the kids to the zoo, so we have until six tonight. You know I can't stay that long. I need to be home by two. Any later, and it might get robbed to wondering. He has already questioned that fact that I don't get home until two. Then skip the hair job and get over here so we can make it happen. Yeah, sure. Then what do I tell Rob when he asks why I've been gone so long and my hair hasn't been done? I want more time with you two, baby, but we have to settle for what we can get. I recognized the man's voice. It was my cousin Lou. I was steaming when I went back upstairs and wondering how many of my other relatives she had screwed or was screwing. I was able to get my anger under control by the time Aggie got home from her hair appointment and was able to hold it together. An hour after she got home, I faked a fall down the basement stairs and told Aggie that I'd hurt my back. Must have pulled a muscle or something. That took care of having to screw her for the next couple of days at least. Monday, I called Aggie at work and told her that I was going to be going out of town on Tuesday and would be gone until Friday and that I'd be home in time to take her out to dinner. There was no trip, of course. It might be a wasted three days, but I didn't think so. I traveled on the average of once a month and Aggie was always home when I made my nightly check and phone call. Since my calls were at irregular times, anywhere from 7 to 10, I doubted that she waited for my calls and then went out so if she was cheating around on me as much as I had been led to believe she was probably doing it on our bed as I was talking to her. That was my hope anyway. If she was and the cameras caught it, I would have what my attorney wanted in the way of irrefutable proof for the divorce action. That evening Aggie wanted to make love. I need something to hold me for the three nights you will be gone. Yeah, right. Fortunately for me, at least my back was still hurting, so I had to beg off. Tuesday morning, Aggie kissed me goodbye in suitcase and hand. I left the house for my business trip. I drove to work and got in almost a full day. I left at three and drove to our neighborhood and parked a block over from the house. Using my laptop, I punched in a code that Marshall had given me that activated the software he had loaded onto my computer. A few keystrokes and I was listening to the recorder on the phone line. Hello. Hey, sexy hunk. It's me. What's up? Hubby just left on a three-day trip. You ready to spend three fun-filled nights with me? Does a duck walk barefoot on the beach? I'll take that as a yes. I leave it to you to call Tony. I've got to get out of here and get to work. I'll be home by six. See you then. I shut down the computer and called Tom Sweet and told him to have the papers ready to serve by Thursday, and then I told him how I wanted it done. He told me that to do it that way would cost me more than the standard service fee, and I told him that I didn't care. I left the neighborhood and drove to the other side of town and checked into a motel. It had a restaurant and a bar just next door and I settled in for a three-day stay. I liked the bar. It was my kind of place and every time I went there it put a big smile on my face, apologies to Toby Keith. It was a country-slash-western bar and the jukebox was loaded with good tunes to dance to and every night I stopped there I saw three or four unattached ladies who couldn't stand to see a man sitting alone while there was music to dance to being played. The first time I was there I was sitting at the bar nursing a long neck where a great looking redhead came up to me and said, Come on sugar, they're playing our song and she took my hand, pulled me off the bar stool and led me out onto the dance floor. As I took her in my arms and started the waltz she said, Don't get the wrong idea sugar, I'm not talling, I just love to dance and you were there. Her name was Rhonda and after the dance she invited me to join her and her two friends, Laura and Shelby, at their table. I spent until 10.30 taking turns dancing with them, and then I told them I had to call it a night. Maybe we will see you again, Rhonda said. We are in here two or three nights a week. I'm just next door in the motel, so it is likely that I will be in here the next two nights. I went to bed in a good mood for the first time since my talk with Wally. The next afternoon at three, I was parked a block over from the house and watching what the wireless cameras had picked up the night before. The two guys who joined Aggie in the bedroom were young guys. They were at least six years younger than Aggie, and I wondered if it was youthful exuberance that Aggie was after. The content was nothing exceptional. It was just plain sucking and screwing, although it was a bit strange seeing my wife double-teamed. The visuals of Aggie screwing the two guys didn't really interest me. 
What I wanted was the audio. I was surprised at what I heard, or more to the point what I didn't hear. I expected to hear Aggie ridiculing me and my lovemaking skills or lack thereof, but she never did shoot me through the grease. It was the same Wednesday. The only time I was mentioned was when one of the guys said that he wished they could get together more often. Aggie told him that she was sorry, but that I had first call on her time. What I did pick up was Aggie telling them that they had to be out of the house by 6 in the morning. None of the neighbors are early risers, so I need you to be gone before they get up and see you leaving. Both Wednesday and Thursday morning they left the house right at 6 and I assumed that it would be the same on Friday. I called my attorney and had him change the serving of the papers until Friday. At 5.45 Friday morning I was parked just down the street from the house. At 5.55 the front door opened and the two guys came out. They turned to say goodbye to Aggie who was standing just inside the door and that is when they saw the man standing just off to the side. He stepped in front of the open door served Aggie, and then turned and walked away leaving Aggie and her two sex buddies looking at his back. I pulled up in front of the house and honked the horn to make sure that I had Aggie's attention and then I waved, bye-bye, and drove off. In the papers that were served on Aggie was a letter from me to her. Basically it said that I never wanted to speak to her again unless it was in the presence of our attorneys. I didn't want to know why. I didn't want to hear that she loved only me and it was just meaningless sex with the others. I didn't want to hear that it wasn't what I thought it was, and I didn't want to hear that we could get by it because of our love for each other. I did not want to hear any of the garbage that cheaters come up with to try and excuse their actions when they get caught. Of course, Aggie paid no attention to the letter, and 15 minutes after I had pulled away from the house, my cell rang, and it was Aggie. I let it go to voicemail along with the next seven calls from her. When I got to work, I told my secretary that I had left Aggie and not to put any calls from her through. I had another thought as I was opening my office door, and I turned back to her. Another thing, Martha. If she shows up here, please tell her that I'm not here. Tell her I've gone to meet with a customer. Martha stuck her head in the door five minutes later. I talked to Iris on the front desk. If your wife shows up, she will call me and stall your wife to give you time to get out the side door. You can go to the cafe and have coffee until she leaves. I thanked her, and as she went back to her desk, I thought, and not for the first time, that a good secretary is a priceless thing to have. Aggie called my cell 17 times that day, and I didn't take any of the calls. At lunchtime, I called my dad and brother and let them know what was going on. I told dad to tell mom and ask her to refrain from trying to get me to sit down and work things out with Aggie, and he told me that he would see what he could do. It would be hard because my mom looked on Aggie as the daughter she never had. At the end of the day, I still had some work that needed to be done. And since I didn't have to hurry home, I decided to stay and finish it up. At five, Martha told me that she was leaving and would see me in the morning. And by the way, your wife called five times before noon, and each time I told her that I had instructions not to put her through to you. I think she finally got the message since she hasn't called since. I finished around seven, and when I got to the lobby, of course Iris was gone, and Hank, our night watchman, was sitting at the reception desk and saw me and said, Hot time on the town tonight with the missus? Why would you think that? She is out there waiting on you. We are getting a divorce, Hank, and she wants to talk, and I don't. If she knocks on the door, don't open it, and if she uses the intercom, tell her that you are alone in the building, and that when you came to work, there was a note in the turnover log that my car was in the lot because I couldn't get it started, and that the towing company would be here in the morning to take it to the shop. Can do. No problem, Mr. Burns. Sorry to hear it. Divorces ain't no fun. Know that cause I've had two of them. I'm going out the back door and avoid her. I went out the back door, went around the block, crossed the street and walked down the alley to the back door of Dave's diner and went in and took a seat. I sat where I could see Aggie waiting by my car. I ordered the special and kept an eye on her while I ate. I was halfway through my dessert when she went up to the building and pressed the call button on the intercom. Hank apparently told her what I'd asked him to because she went back to her car and left. I finished dessert had one more cup of coffee, and then left. I stopped in the bar for a beer or two, and even thought there were a couple of ladies there alone hoping for a dance partner, I had my two beers and left. Saturday morning was a busy one for me as I ran around, and did all the things I should have done before serving Aggie. I just hoped that I wasn't too late, and she hadn't gotten around to doing what I should have done. I hit the bank and cleaned out all the accounts, and took the certificates of deposit and my personal papers out of the safe deposit box but left all of Aggie's stuff in it. I took off my wedding ring and dropped it in the box for her to find. I hit the Waffle House for breakfast, and while there I used my cell phone to call and take care of the credit cards. There were only two that were joint, and I canceled them both. 
that left me with a visa and an American Express that were in my name only. Aggie also had two in her name only so all I really accomplished was make sure she couldn't run up the joint cards by taking out cash advances. When I finished breakfast, I drove back to the motel, parked my car, and called a cab to take me to the nearest Avis rental place. I rented the cheapest car they had and went back to the motel. I spent the afternoon lounging by the motel pool and reading a book. Just before I went to eat, I turned on my cell phone and checked for messages. There were nine and all from Aggie. I cleared them and then turned the phone back off. I had a light dinner and then headed for the bar. The bar had a live band on Friday and Saturday and the place was packed. I found a seat at the bar and ordered a beer. I downed about half of it when I felt a tug on my shirt. I turned and saw Rhonda standing there. Hey cowboy, why are you sitting here when there is a seat at our table for you? Didn't see you what with the crowd and all. To be honest about it, had I seen you, I wouldn't have intruded on you. It would have seemed like I was taking things for granted. Nonsense. Come on. I got up and followed her to her table and saw that Laura and Shelby were also there. I sat down, said hi to the girls, and then said, There seems to be something wrong with this picture. Three stone foxes sitting at a table alone, and you aren't swamped with guys? You had to come and get me? That just ain't right. We get a lot of attention, but it is usually from a-holes. They see us here, notice the wedding rings, and think that we are here looking for some guy for the night. Just three 304s out looking to cheat on their husbands. We are just here because we want to dance, and only a couple of guys understand that and accept it. The rest think they are God's gift to women, and we have to fight them off. After the other night, we know that you are one of the good guys, and you have an open invitation to join us whenever you come in, and we are here. It isn't any of my business, and I know it's so feel free to tell me that. But I have to ask, why are three gorgeous married women spending time in a place like this without your husbands? It is a legitimate question, Rhonda said. Laura's husband is in the Army Reserve and his unit was sent to Afghanistan. She was going nuts cooped up in her house alone, so we decided to get her out. Shelby's husband works afternoons and my hubby is a long-haul trucker and has gone a lot so the three of us banded together to keep each other company. We love to dance and here we are. What's your story? I noticed that you had a ring on last time we saw you and now it is gone. I served my wife with divorce papers yesterday morning and took the ring off and left it where she would find it. Do you feel that frees you up to hunt? Not in the least. The grounds were adultery and I have no intention of doing anything that she can use for grounds in a countersuit. Goody, Laura said. We have a safe dancing partner. I spent the rest of the evening until closing time taking turns dancing with the three of them and sharing them with the occasional guy they said yes to. Sunday, I spent a quiet day beside the pool with a book and Monday, I drove the rental car to work. My hope was that Aggie wouldn't see my car and would think I was out of town again and stay away. The week went by with me getting anywhere from 6 to 10 calls a day from Aggie, which I never took. Twice she called me from numbers I didn't recognize and when I answered and heard her voice I hung up on her. I stopped by the bar every night after dinner and had a beer or two. Rhonda, Laura and Shelby were there on Wednesday and Friday and I joined them. I danced with them until 10 on Wednesday and until closing on Friday. I figured that by Saturday Aggie would have figured out that I wasn't going to talk to her, so I turned in my rental and drove my car to work on Monday. Bad move on my part. Monday, she was parked next to my car when I came out of the building. When she saw me coming, she got out of her car and was standing by my car's driver's side door. She said, we need to talk Rob, when I got to the car. I ignored her, and she moved to block the door. Come on, Rob. You need to let me explain. I pushed her out of the way, and she stumbled and almost fell, and by the time she had regained her balance I was in the car. I rolled the window down and said, You need to go back and read the letter that was with the divorce papers, Aggie. I will not talk to you unless my attorney is present, and even then all I will talk about is the details of the divorce. I don't want a divorce, Rob. And I don't want you, Aggie. We are done. Accept it because I'm not going to change my mind. I rolled the window up and drove off leaving her standing there. That Aggie wasn't going to accept my refusal to talk to her became apparent to me when I got off work Tuesday. When I walked up to my car, two guys came up to me and each took hold of one of my arms. I recognized them as the two that had screwed Aggie in our bedroom. One of them said, Don't do anything stupid, old man, and you won't get hurt. Miss Aggie says she wants to talk to you, and you are being obstinate so we are taking you to her. The easy way or the hard way, but you are coming with us. Old man? I was only six or maybe seven years older than they were. They must have thought that since I was wearing a suit and a tie and carrying a briefcase I was some soft old guy. I figured that I could take them. They wouldn't be expecting the old guy to do anything against the two of them 
so surprised should let me get one of them out of the way, and one-on-one -on -one I was pretty sure that I could take the other one. Either way, the fracas would draw attention, and their little kidnapping caper would be in the shit can. But then I thought, do I really want to? If Aggie was going to go to those lengths just to get to Octomy, what would she try next if I sent these two back to her all bloodied up? I allowed them to push me into my car, and I sat between them, briefcase on my lap, as I was driven to the house. They escorted me inside and Aggie told them to sit me down in a chair and make sure that I stayed there. She turned to me and said, We are not getting a divorce. When she said that I started to get up from the chair, but the two guys pushed me back down and held me there as one of them said, You will stay put if you know what is good for you. We are going to stay married, Aggie said, but there will be a few changes in the way we live. I'm sorry that you found out about my medical problem, but now that you know you are going to have to live with it. I love you. Believe it or not, I love you, and I'm not letting you go. Medical problem? What medical problem? I have nymphomania. I have been a nymphomaniac since high school. You unleashed it when you took my virginity. Nonsense. They have drugs that can treat that sort of thing. Yes, they do, and I've tried them all. They make me sluggish and stupid, and I don't like sitting around looking like a retard. Besides, I like being a nympho. I love to screw, and you should know that. Lord knows I hardly ever leave you alone and what I do doesn't hurt you in the least. I love you, and I spoil you rotten. So, what if I let someone have what you couldn't use anyway? If you could stay hard 24-7, I wouldn't need anyone else, but you can't, and I need it so I give the excess to others. I don't love them. I love you, and I always come home to you. Here's the way it is going to be. I have written up a post-nuptial agreement where you agree to my having as many lovers as I require to keep my sanity. You agree to leave the marriage with nothing if you later decide you don't want to continue the marriage under those conditions. And in exchange, what do I get besides a 304 for a wife? You get the same loving wife you have had for the past six years, and you know full well that you considered those years perfect. You considered our marriage and our life perfect even though the entire time I was doing what you now have a problem with. All that is wrong now is that your ego is involved. Someone else is using something that you have always considered yours and yours alone. You just need to accept that our life will continue the same as it has for the last six years. You need to accept that it does not mean that you are not man enough for me. You are a marvelous lover and you always, and I do mean always, leave me completely satisfied when we make love. You just can't do it as much as I need it. I'll tell you what Agnes, she hated to be called Agnes. I'll sign it if you make a few changes to it. What kind of changes? You don't ever have sex with me on a day you have sex with others and we sleep in separate bedrooms. I can't do that. I need you, and I need you in the bed with me. Why can't you get it through your thick skull that I love you, and I don't want to lose you? That's okay, Agnes. Don't make the changes. I didn't want to sign your so-called agreement anyway. All right. I'll make the damned changes and work on getting you back in bed with me later. I'll go to the computer, make the changes, and be right back. I tried to get off the chair, but the two guys forced me to sit there. I told them I had to go to the bathroom and one of them said, Just pee your pants. Miss Aggie said to keep you in the chair, so you aren't getting up until she says so. Aggie came back five minutes later, read the document to me, and I said, Where do I sign? She held out a pen, and I said, Your two goons won't let me get up. Let them up, guys. I got up, walked over to her, and set my briefcase down on the table and took the pen from her. Then I put the pen down and said, Not that I don't trust you, but I think I'll read it just to be sure that it says what you said it says. I picked it up, read it, and then I laughed and tore it up and threw it in her face. I picked up my briefcase and headed for the door. Stop him. Aggie yelled and the two guys started after me and when they were close enough I spun around toward them with my briefcase heading for the first guy's head. It was a solid hit and he went down. The second guy was caught by surprise and before he realized it I was on him. I punched him in the mouth and he stumbled backwards and I kicked him in the balls as hard as I could and he went down. Being no dummy I knew that at two against one I needed to keep them down and I went to work giving the boot to both of them. I took turns kicking them in the crotch, ribs and head until Aggie screamed. Stop it Rob or I'll shoot you. I looked over at Aggie and saw that she was pointing a gun at me. Got ahead and shoot you miserable witch. I took out my cell phone, called 911, gave my name and address and told the operator that my wife was pointing a gun at me and threatening to shoot me. The operator told me to stay calm and do nothing that would excite my wife, and that a car was on the way. I closed the phone and said, Thank you, Agnes. The divorce will go a lot quicker and easier with you in jail. That was stupid, Rob. When the police get here, you will be the one arrested. You came in, found me talking to two friends, 
flew into a jealous rage and attacked them. It will be your word against ours. Three against one, and we are fully clothed. You will be arrested for assault. Oh, Agnes, how could you? There's all that love you have for me shining through. Don't sweat it, Rob. I'll bail you out and Barry and Tony won't press charges. It will all work out. Think again, Agnes. Hank saw these two bozos pick me up at work and Joyce next door saw them escort me into the house. My story is that you had me brought here against my will, and when I attempted to leave you told your lovers to stop me, and they tried and lost, and then you pulled a gun on me. I may end up spending a night in jail, but when my witnesses speak their piece you will be the one sitting in jail and I damn sure won't be getting your bail. Let's see what we have here. Kidnapping. Unlawful detainment. I'm sure that there is some sort of charge for threatening me with a gun, and lastly there will be knowingly making false statements to the police. There may even be others that I can't think of. Your best bet, Agnes, is to keep your mouth shut. Aggie didn't take my advice and she and her two flunkies told their lies and I was taken to jail. In the morning, I called Tom Sweet, told him what was going on and that he should get with Gaston Marshall, get the tapes, and then do what had to be done. Aggie found out that she couldn't bail me out because I first had to go in front of a judge to get bail set and that wouldn't happen until Monday. Tom had a friend who was an assistant district attorney and he played the tapes of what happened at the house for him. It showed Barry and Tony restraining me and Aggie pointing the gun at me, and the ADA heard her say she was going to lie and have her two Confederates lie. When Aggie showed up at the courthouse Monday morning for my bail hearing she was arrested, warrants were sworn out for Barry and Tony, and by nightfall they were under lock and key. I refused to put up the bail for Aggie and her parents didn't have the money and couldn't get it. Aggie got an attorney and he called me and told me that a bail bondsman wanted me to put up the house as security for her bail bond and I laughed at him and hung up. I moved out of the motel and back into the house and then called the locksmith and had all the locks changed. Because Aggie had threatened me with a gun, Tom was able to get an order of protection against Aggie. If she did somehow manage to get out of jail, she couldn't come within 1,000 feet of me without being arrested and sent back to jail. As good as sex with Aggie's might have been, it apparently wasn't worth doing serious time over, and both Barry and Tony gave up Aggie and took deals. Aggie said that she would never have pulled the trigger on me. She was just trying to get me to stop beating on her two cohorts before I killed one of them and had to go to jail for it. The jury saw the tape and decided from some of the things she said, specifically her protestations of love for me, that she was probably telling the truth when she said she was only trying to stop me from killing Barry or Tony. They found her not guilty on the felony menacing charge, but did find her guilty of the unlawful restraint charges and the making a false police report charge and several other small charges. The judge gave her nine months in the county jail and 1,000 hours of community service when she was released from custody. While she was in jail, the divorce skated through and all I lost on the deal, besides Aggie, was 20% of the equity in the house. I put the money in her account at the bank and then headed for the bar next to the motel I had stayed at. I was in luck. Rhonda and Shelby were there and I asked them to celebrate my first day of freedom with me. Laura wasn't there because her hubby was home from the wars and they were busy getting reacquainted and playing catch-up. So why do you want to celebrate with us, Rhonda asked. Because I'm taking a shot in the dark here. I saw the rings on Laura and I can see the rings on Shelby, but you aren't wearing rings and I see no lines on your fingers that would indicate that you ever did have them, so I am betting that there is no long-haul trucker in your life. That and I've always had a thing for hot-looking redheads. Shelby laughed and said, you were so busted, girl, as I pulled Rhonda off her chair and let her out onto the dance floor. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.